right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn them to Romans 11.32. Romans 11.32. And we'll be reading through chapter 12, verse 2. And today we're going to be starting on a new series uh, called Consecrate. Consecrate. It's a term that's really not used a lot in today's world, but that's okay. We're going to uh, dig it out from the past, and we're going to bring it up to today for us. Mm -hmm. um, and as you're turning in your, your Bibles, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, don't sweat it. We're going to have the scripture on the, on, the, uh, on the screens. But also, just so you know, we do have Bibles right in front of you. Um, in the seat in front of you that you can use as well. Um, but this whole, this whole next few weeks is going to be quite a journey. And if I could, I, I just want to get your attention real quick. This is from my heart. For the next few weeks, I will tell you that this is not only going to be a journey, but it's going to be a little bit of an arduous journey. It's going to be a little bit of a journey that's going to stretch you a bit. It's going to be a journey that will um, benefit you for sure. Um, but as any of you read the poster or any of the promotional materials about this, this is going to be a two-part series. Not a two-week series, but a two-part series. The first part is going to be between now and February 17th based on teaching. And then the second part of it is going to be February 17th through March 9th, in which we're going to use that time to do fasting and praying. And some of you may have not ever experienced fasting and praying. You don't even know what that's about, maybe, and that's okay. We're going to go into that. That's what the teaching is about. And it occurs to me that first we need to get taught, we need to get educated, I need to get educated, you need to get educated. Anytime that God is taking us on a new venture, we need to get educated on that, and then we go on the adventure. And so that's what we're going to be doing. So for these next three weeks, we're going to take it in three parts. This week is going to have not a lot, let's put it that way, not a lot to do with prayer and fasting, but we're going to talk about the consecrated life. What does it mean to be consecrated to God. And that's what we're going to start with first. Because a lot of times when Christians go into a new venture, they get all excited, especially let's just take prayer and fasting. You get all excited about it and you want to go for it. And you want to please God and you want to you really want to just give him your all. And that's understandable and that's good. But if you don't have a foundation for that, you're going to quickly fall, right? Right, And as this is uh, the end of the football season, the Super Bowl is today, um, you know, as well as I do, that all of those athletes trained. They had a period of training that they had to go through to eventually get to where they're at right now. And any time that God wants us to do something for him, there's a time that we go through in a, in a training atmosphere. And so that's what we're going to do today. Um, but I, I am not going to water this down at all. The prayer and fasting time, it should stretch you. It should hurt a little bit. And that's okay. That's a good thing. Because anything that gets ourselves unfocused, gets our focus off of us, and gets it on to God, that's a good thing. Sometimes it may hurt, but it's a good thing. It's healthy. So, um, so that's what's going to be happening over the next few weeks. And I think this is going to be great. We did this last year. Um, we did the prayer fasting last year, and I got a lot of stories about what God was doing in people's lives through that. And so I think it's, it's, it's going to be not only a good thing, but it's going to be healthy for us as well. So... Let's start with what consecration is, okay? As I told you, it's, it's an old term. We don't use it a lot today, but consecration. 
It's basically this, to simply to set apart for a task. You've heard me talk about the big $3 word, sanctification. And that again, that's being set apart to be holy. Well, consecration is basically this, to set apart for a task. Or to set yourself apart not only for a task, but to a certain person. Like for instance, every day I need to be consecrated to my marriage with Sherry. I need to be 100% hers. And so when we talk about consecration, we're talking about I am 100% all in. There's no part of me that's left out. I am 100% in. I am for this. Okay? Doesn't mean we won't make mistakes, but we're 100% in. So what is biblical consecration? Biblical consecration is this. It's the act of a Christian being separated from the ungodly and being dedicated to the triune God and his purpose. In other words, it's being totally dedicated to God. And I said purposely, triune God. Hear what I'm saying. Because in today's culture, when you say God, that can mean a lot of things. Amen. And what we're talking about God, if I'm going to dedicate myself to God, I am talking about the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. Talking about a God who is holy, who is just. Talking about a God who is merciful, who is gracious, who loves people, who loves you. And so we're talking about setting aside every single thing, like the book of Hebrews, setting aside every weight that would hinder us, that would pull us down, so that we can step up to the plate for God. It's like Ephesians says in Ephesians 2.10, for we, that is Christians, followers of Jesus, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He wants us to do certain things for him, but we can't do that if we're halfway in. We can't do that if we're a quarter of the way in. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. I get up, give Sherry goodbye, beginning of the day, go to work, and then at the end of the day, instead of coming home and saying, well, I'm going to go ahead and stay in a hotel tonight. <laughs> because that's my time. Okay, that's, that's me time. Okay, that's for me. So I'm just going to, I know I was consecrated to you at the beginning of the day. But then I had to go to work. I had to earn some cash. But now, now it's all about me. So I got I to gotta go do my thing, okay? So I'm going to stay. I'll let you know where I'm going. I'm staying at this hotel. But that's me time. So we have mutual respect for one another, 50-50, okay, great. No, what God is saying in the marriage is he says 100-100 together, looking up to God, consecrated to each other. To do an amazing work, not a perfect work, but to do an amazing work in marriage, we have to be 100-100. We need to be together on this. And part of Scott can't be off elsewhere. I mean, 100%. That doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. But it means we're all there. We're 100% all in. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. All right. Good. So we are his workmanship. We're not our own workmanship. We were, we were created in Christ Jesus. He gave us a new life. So if we are then what does this look like? Well, let's look at today's text out of Romans 11, 32 through 12, 2. And it says this, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? <coughs> or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. I agree. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So in this, in this whole text here, we see a consecration to God. We see things like present your bodies. We, think, we see things like living sacrifice. That's scary, especially in today's selfish culture, especially in today's selfie culture, especially in, in today's, look, just leave me alone. At the end of the day, all I wanna do is just sit on the couch and bed. I don't need to be bothered with family. I don't need to be bothered with God. I don't need to be bothered with anything. Just give me a burrito and be quiet, okay? That's what we're, sometimes we can be about. What, what God is saying here is that he's giving us phrases that may not be relevant to us right now, but as we walk in him, we'll start to see the freedom in him and those phrases are going to be able to start to be seen as very relevant. And not only relevant to us, but very sustainable in our lives. It's very scary to give up something, isn't it? Like if God is calling you to, he's not asking you, God doesn't ask. He's calling you, he's got commands all throughout the scripture. He's calling you to give something up. And he does woo you to him. He is very gentle sometimes in the way that he calls you to do stuff. He's right next to you. But when he calls you to do stuff, to give things up, it's very scary because we look at that thing that we have to give up. And what's on the other side of it, we don't know because we've never given that thing up. And we don't know what's on the other side of that thing. And we can't see God's grace. And when we start to give that thing up, we're like, oh, we can't do it. Because if I give that thing up, that means I lose my freedom. And what we don't see is we're staying enslaved to ourselves by not giving that thing up. And we're very scared. And that's a very understandable feeling. God understands that. And yet, he says living sacrifice. And yet, he calls us to better. He calls us to greater things. In the end, what we're going to learn to see in this whole process, what you're going to learn to see in the praying process, in the fasting process, is that as you give up, you will find freedom because he's going to fill that other side of the unknown. And we're going to hit on things like my grace is sufficient. Christ is my all in all. I, I can carry my cross through him who strengthens me. And I find out my reward is not only his blessings, but him. And we're going to be able to take great comfort, great joy in that. And every single one of us in this room struggles with that unknown. From the pulpit, right here from me, all the way to everybody else. We struggle with that unknown. We're going to learn what does it mean to be 100% in. So we're going to go through the text, Romans 11:32. First, what does the Bible mean when it says in verse 32, God has consigned us all to a disobedience? He basically recognizes. He recognizes that everybody's a sinner. Everybody breaks God's law. We're all cosmic lawbreakers. We all fall short. We all make mistakes against him and against others that deserves eternal punishment for daring having the audacity to go against the holy God who created us in the first place. And we go against his love. He's merely recognizing that since we sin, we're all sinners. And we're sinners because we sin. And that since we disobey, we're people that are disobedient. He's just calling out the obvious is what he's doing. He's calling out the obvious. And, and look, being a sinner, it's, it's not what we do, but it's who we are. That's who we are. 
We are lawbreakers against God's law. You say, well, I've never murdered before. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, if you look upon somebody with, Jesus said this, if you look upon somebody with anger in your heart, it's just that you're just as guilty as committing the sin of murder. What? That's not relevant for me. Well, actually it's relevant to the human heart because the human heart is desperately wicked, the Bible says. Who can know it? And so when we see that it's not just what we do but who we are, then we start to see things in a whole new light. And we start to see how far we are from being able to be consecrated. Pastor Scott, you're talking about being consecrated, being all in 100% to God. <clears throat> how can we do this? And then you have verses like Romans 3, 23, which just says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all fall short of his glory. Are we supposed to get to his glory? Unless, and here's the good news, unless we go back to Romans 11.32, that he may have mercy on all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the thing. Maybe there's somebody in here today who really needs that mercy. You've had an awful week. God says his mercies are new every morning. Amen. Every morning. And just as true, listen, just as true as it is in the fact that we sin and go against people and go against God, it's also true that God has mercy and pours that out. And he loves to pour out mercy. Yes. But he is a balanced God. If anything, he is balanced. And so... <clears throat> This is where we find out about getting into a right relationship with God. Now up here you see the cross. And here's what happened on the cross. Here's what happened that has to do with the cross, with the resurrection, everything. God sent his son. This is the gospel. We're talk we were talking about being a sinner. We go back to verse 32. It has mercy on all of us. How does he have mercy? The gospel, the good news. He sent his son miraculously, a, a miraculous virgin birth. He lived perfectly. He, he lived perfectly. That's crazy. I can't go through five minutes living perfectly. <laughs> That's nuts. I mean, think about it. Even, even if you don't do something bad, you think something bad, right? Yeah. So he lives perfectly. This is a revolution of love. And then he displays all of that grace on people he came to seek and to save those who were lost. And then he dies on a cross. He's falsely accused, but he dies on the cross for our sins. And then he raises from the dead. He, ra he gets raised from the dead. Yep. He raises from the dead. He, he was dead and now he's alive. That's what? That's monumental. Like when's the last time you saw that happen? I, ha I have not seen that happen. And yet this man, this God has enough love for us to say I'm coming down there to this sin sick, this sin broken world to live perfectly and to die for you so that I'm going to live again so that your sins may be forgiven. Amen. That is amazing. Yes. That is so free. So that he may have mercy on all. And in doing that, when you come to Christ and you receive him as your savior and you get your sins forgiven, this is basically what happens. God himself consecrates you, sets you apart to himself once and forever, positionally. You're with him positionally. Like when you die, when they roll your old body down the thing and put you in a casket, or they 
whatever, light you on fire and that's the end of your body, whatever it is. When you die, your, your soul is going to have to be with him forever. Yeah, Amen. that's right. Amen. Forever. Hallelujah. Okay? And so positionally, you were right there with him. But remember, you go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and it's by grace that you were saved through faith. It's not of works, lest you could boast. So because he consecrated you to himself positionally, then you spend the rest of your life consecrating or totally giving yourself back to Christ practically. So because of what he did for you positionally, now there's no way we can ever repay him but we're going to spend the rest of our lives giving back our all in all to him. That's, right. That's awesome. Yep, man. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That is, what a deal. Mm -hmm. We get a great deal. Glory. We get an awesome deal. It's amazing. So if you, if you consecrate yourself to Christ, you are literally separating yourself from the fleeting attitudes of this world and from who you used to be, like Colossians 3, 7 says and Ephesians 2, 3 says, said we used to walk that way. We used to go to the bar. We used to go to the club. We used to think we were all that. We used to be very moral and righteous in our own eyes, think we were great and we don't need God. Or we used to be atheists or we used to be worshipers of false gods or we used to be abusers, or we used to be people who shot up drugs. We used to be that way, but now we're not anymore. We used to walk in that, that way, but now we are on board with the forever plans of God for ourselves. Remember going back to, he carved out those good works for us to walk in. And so God is good. Yes, you can say it. God is good. Oh, that's right. And it's good to walk with God. It's good to walk for God. It's good to walk for his plans and his purposes. And there's a freedom feeling when you get, and a lot of you know me that I'm not all into feelings. I'm, I'm more of a nuts and bolts kind of guy. But I will admit that God has given us emotions and feelings. And there is a freedom feeling that you get when you're unshackled, when you're unchained from the selfishness of this life to experience the power of living for God. Like you used to be that way like six months ago because, because that's what you liked. Because sin is pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. But then the Holy Spirit said, I have other plans for you. I'm moving in. Um, I am Lord. You are not. Therefore, my Lordship goes over your whole life. And it's time to bow to me. And I'm going to work in you. I'm God and I love you enough to say you're not going to stay that way. We're walking in a new life. Amen? amen. By the way, when we say amen, we say I agree with that. Yeah. I'm agreeing with that. So another part in consecrating yourself to God is this. It's the wonder of God. So in the Christian life, we understand that we must consecrate ourselves to Christ, but in that long journey of the Christian life, because of our weak nature, we don't always stay in awe of him. And this is where we need the wonder of God. Like, for instance, like you come to a church service and there's everybody else here and we're all celebrating God, but then you get out of the parking lot and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, ah, and you're like, you lose it. And you forget the awe of God, the majesty of God. Again, understandable, but not condonable. Is condonable a word? I don't know. Anyway, but he does not condone that. But in Romans 3, 11, 33 through 35, let's take a look. Just, just take a fresh look. Just listen in like, like your ears are sponges, okay? Let this just seep in, okay? Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. 
For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? This is the wonder of God. So if we're going to consecrate ourselves to him, if we're going to dedicate ourselves to him, we need to know the wonder of God. And if we're in awe of something, if, if we, when we get in awe of something, we want to be like that something or that somebody, like your favorite painter or somebody that you look up to or whatever it may be, that's something you, you look up to it. And this is like, this is who God is. And, and look, at, look at the verse here, it says, and how inscrutable are his ways. Inscrutable, we can't understand his ways. I, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, of a life crisis right now. God jumps into that, helps me get through it, or miraculously takes care of it for me. But I'm still walking through it with him. I didn't understand how he made it happen, but he made it happen. How in the world did he do that? Like I got in a wreck, but I didn't lose my life. How in the world did God accomplish that? Inscrutable are his ways. I'm in awe of him. And unsearchable. I, you can tell me about it from the pulpit, but unless I read it in the word and experience him myself, what am I going to do? I'm lost without him. And if you feel lost today, getting in awe of who God really is, that will help you to gain back that wonder of him. And I know I've spoken about this before, but in Isaiah 6, it's not in my notes, but most of you remember this story in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And the doorposts, they shook. And smoke filled the room. And, and by the way, there are angels around his throne with six wings. With two, they flew. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. I mean, the presence of the holiness of God is all there, and Isaiah is in wonder and in awe. And he finally says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am literally disintegrating in the presence of a holy God. If not for his presence to my own self, what in the world are the doorposts doing shaking? They're not even alive, and even they shake at the awe and the wonder of God. Glory. This is an amazing God who is seated on his throne, high and lifted up. Come on. If we lose the wonder of God, and it is understandable why we would lose the wonder of God, is because we're far away from him. He is not far away from us. So get back to him. Repent. Turn up back to him. We do this, we turn away when we get in trouble, when we hurt sometimes. And then God uses those things to bring us closer to him. So one of the things that I pray when people come to me, for pray for this, pray for that, pray for the other thing. I pray, you know, God uses this situation to bring them closer to you. Because I know it's not going to be me or my fantastic wisdom, whatever that is, that's going to help them out. You know what it's going to be? It's not it, it's who, it's God. Jesus Christ is going to help them out through this. We need that awe of God. And also, <clears throat> this consecration is a matter of worship to God. Now here we go. We got done with the, <coughs> with the brokenness, but we needed mercy. We become born again. Now we're in the family of God. And now we went to the wonder of God. And now we're into the consecration part. Here comes the consecration part. Consecration is a matter of worship to God. It always has been. It always will be. <clears throat> worship proclaim to God through your voice. And we see this as we continue to go along, scripture by scripture, verse by verse. Watch this. 
Verse 36, from, from him, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I agree, the Apostle Paul says. He says, I agree to that. I agree that to him are all things. And in our exaltation, which is praise, we are exalting him with a U, not A. We are exalting him. We are showing him extreme joy about God. So in our, let me say it again, in our exaltation, we are exalting God. In our praise to God, we just got done with the wonder, but in the praise to God, we are showing the ultimate joy that's already in our hearts because what God has done in our lives, he's made us born again. He saved us from his wrath to be poured out on people for all eternity because they would not turn from their sins. But thank God, God said, I give you salvation. I'm offering it to you. Take my son, receive my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fall on his righteousness. Fall on his mercy. Receive him. And from that, he saves me from my sins. I don't have to endure the wrath of God forever and eternity. And now I can experience the joy and the wonder and the awe of him forever and ever and ever. That's one of the great things about heaven is that it will never end. Ever. Amen. Ever. Look, your time on earth and your suffering will end one day. Just make sure you're on this side of the cross. Yeah. So you can experience the wonder. That's just one of the benefits of going to heaven. But our exaltation, in that we are exulting, we are showing extreme joy about God and to God. And listen. Listen to this. Your worship, your worship to Christ will only go as high. Your godly love towards others will only be as passionate. Your devotion in prayer will only be as rich. Your dying to sin will only be as frequent. And your heavenly joy, I'm sorry, your heavenly joy in life will only be as abundant as your death is into his word. Are you getting with God every day? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, my relationships are terrible. Um, I'm not doing as well as I could. Uh, this, that, and the other thing. I'm complaining, complaining, complaining. In fact, every time I react to a situation, I'm reacting and complaining. Did you get along with God this morning to get a realignment? Simply put this. Let's put the, the blanks one on there. Blank Bible time equals blank knowledge about God, which of course equals blank worship. Let me throw some words in there. Little Bible time equals little knowledge about God, which of course leads to little worship. Let me put the spin on it that we all want. Watch this. Good and a whole bunch of big, fat, huge lots of Bible time <laughs> equals big, fat, huge lots of knowledge about God, which, of course, equals lots and lots of big, fat, huge worship mm -hmm. to God. Is that an amen or an I agree, whichever one you choose? Yes. Amen. amen. Look, that's, that's not a, a theolo deep theological thing. This is, this is this Captain Obvious talking to you right now. Is just exactly what will happen. Look, if you put a lot into it, you get a lot out. If you put a little into it, you get a little out. But my concern for you is if you put little to nothing in that, is there anything about God that you even want? That makes no sense. It makes no sense to me to go to a church service every once in a while. And I'm glad that this happens because people can hear the word, but... If it's your lifestyle to be religious and just say I'm religious or to make connections at the church just to do that, look, I've ex I didn't grow up in the church, and I know there's fun to be had out there outside of Christ. 
pleasures of sin for a season. Why am I going to waste my time being religious when I can just go out and have fun? I mean, this is my flesh talking, my sinful nature talking. Understand that. But I know better because Christ redeemed me. He bought me back. And I know that God has eternally more for me and for you. And that's why I know that because Christ redeemed me, because Christ forgave me, that when I give lots of Bible time, quality Bible time, I get lots of knowledge and quality knowledge about God, which of course is going to lead to joyous, big, fat, huge, nothing but worship in the presence of God. And isn't he awesome? even through my most difficult times. Amen. Amen. Glory. Glory. You're wasting your time if you're playing a religious game. Right. Get out of the game and surrender to God. Mm -hmm. Just throw the flag up. Just yeah. stop it. <laughs> throw the flag up. Okay? That's what we're created to do is to worship God. We are worship, we're worshipers by nature. Everybody on the planet, we're all worshipers. We're going to worship something, somebody. I'm tired of worshiping myself. I want to worship God. I want to be passionate about God. I want to go for him. I want to love him. And it pains me when I don't. I want him. Let me tell you something about wanting him. You're going to have to put on your seatbelts just for a minute. Because I want to tell you a quick story. There is a hymn called, And Can It Be? You may know about it as Amazing Love. The hymn that we know as Amazing Love or And Can It Be was written by a Methodist minister named Charles Wesley in 1738. That's a long time ago. Getting some feedback here. Oh, it's in both. It's all monitors. There we go. All right. I don't know what happened to Mike. Okay. <laughs> I am so sorry. By the way, our tech team is amazing, and thank you, all of you, for doing what you do every Sunday. Y'all are, are fantastic. Listen to this. <clears throat> the hymn that we know as Amazing Love or Anne Canopy was written by a Methodist minister named Charles Wesley in 1738. Now think about this as we're getting ready to go into the fasting and prayer teaching, and then later the fasting and prayer doing season. We're building a foundation. We're in no rush. Okay? We're going to get there. It's all right. <coughs> but he, Charles Wesley, was caught in the trap of legalism. And a mission trip to the American colony of Georgia proved to be disastrous, and Charles came home broken and ill. And that's totally understandable for a pastor. The pastor receives everybody's emotional baggage. And if you don't deal with that correctly to God, it can break you. So after his return, both he and his brother made the acquaintance of a guy named Peter Bowler, who urged Charles to look more deeply at the state of his soul and who taught them about true Christianity. So in May of 1738, once again ill, Charles read Martin Luther's book on Galatians and was convicted. And he wrote, at midnight, I gave myself to Christ, assured that I was safe, whether sleeping or waking. I had the continual experience of his power to overcome all temptation. And I confessed with joy and surprise that he was able to do exceedingly abundantly for me above what I can ask or think. Dear Christian, let me stop in the middle of the story. Dear Christian, 
let me tell you, there are a lot of you that are trying to impress and please God, and your heart is in the right place. But please do not make it a set of rules in your own heart that you have to accomplish, a set of ladders that you have to accomplish in your own heart. I am asking, pleading, begging you to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to work through you. And when he is gently whispering, I need you to do this, you do it. Not, I am guilted and afraid and ashamed and in fear of if I don't do that. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. yeah. I am doing through you versus... I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm going to try anyway. I hope you like it. <laughs> a big difference. Now, listen. He also journaled, I now found myself at peace with God and rejoiced in hope of loving Christ. I saw that by faith I stood. Two days later, he began writing a hymn that many believe to be and can be. Or can and can it be. Amazing love. Here's what, the, here's what the hymn says. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but let the words marinate in your system. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh, my God, it found me. Found me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, God should die for me. Mm. Listen to this. No condemnation now I dread. <clears throat> Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die? That is joy that can only come from a forgiven spirit. And when you spend that time alone with God, it will go from, do I have to spend time alone with him? I don't have time to spend alone with him. It'll go from that to, I cannot wait to get with my God. So consecration is a matter of worship to God, and worship is proclaimed to God through your voice. Because if you are exalting God, you will be exalting God. And also, consecration is a matter of worship to God via worship lived out through your body. And here's where the difficulty comes. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And all the Christians who are familiar with this voice said a big yawn and ha la 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 because we've heard it all before. Listen. I don't put you in that category. I put me in that category because there are some times when my ears get dull because I've heard it before. But to hear it fresh is good. And listen to this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Stop right there. The mercies, oitermos, meaning this, I, 
Uh, I'll read to you like this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by my compassion, my pity on you, my, my mercy towards you, from the very bowels of my being, God says, with my heart of compassion, with all my emotions, with all my longings, with all my love for you, with all that I am, and my full-on pursuit of your heart. I want your heart. I want your mind. I don't want your schedule. I don't want your, what your theological thoughts say that I am. I want you. I don't want your preconceived notions. I want you. I want your heart. <coughs> and we in turn say, God, I want your law written on my heart. I want your mercies in my spirit so that when I do sin, I can fall right on the righteousness of Christ and say, I am here. I am positionally blameless. It's what we want. And then he says, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, to present, what's his, what is that word? Peristomy. It says here, I am here. I'm, I'm right at hand. It's a posture that says I'm ready to serve you, God. So I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that I am right here. I am I'm presenting myself, God. I am right here. I'm right here at hand, ready to wait on you, God as a living sacrifice. As if that my next step and my next breath would be to die for you. We can all say we can die for God. We will die for God. But who among us is willing to say with our bodies we are willing to live mm -hmm. for God? Mm -hmm. Amen. And this is the practice of holiness. This is the practice of righteousness. And this is the practice that can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit, recognizing the amazing love that God has for us. His amazing love propels us, doesn't it? And we want to be holy, and there is a deep need in us to live that way. And that's why when we sin, there's a holy hatred for our sin, the self-deprecation. You know, interesting about <clears throat> living holy for God, I've never received a prayer request. Listen up. I've never received a prayer request that said, please let my holiness during my sufferings be used by God to help bring someone to Christ. I've never received a prayer request like that. Hmm. But ladies and gentlemen, if you are a living sacrifice, that means through the good and the bad, We want to use all those things to be able to be used as a witness so that we can bring others to Christ. And am I saying that I've never received a prayer request like that? If I have, I'm sorry. Let's just say it this way. There are very few far in between. <laughs> I don't think I've ever written a prayer request like that to somebody. But I know that's my heart, and I know that's your heart too. You want your your sufferings to be used for Christ. And then lastly is this, as we come in for a landing, consecration is a matter of worship to God. Your worship lived out to God through your mind. Your mind. You know, there's this, there's this thing where we're too busy to, to learn. I just bought a, uh, <clears throat> big book on theology so I can grow more. And I think for everybody, everybody who's a Christian, we need to continue to educate ourselves. I think it's a good thing. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that word conform there is acting like the opposite of what's really inside. In other words, you don't want to be like the world. You don't want to be like the world system. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be selfish. 
Christians at heart don't want to be like that. You, and you don't want to be pressed into the mold of the world. You're the opposite. You say this world is not my home, but yet I live in it to glorify God and to bring others to Jesus Christ. And then there's a word called transform. <clears throat> transform means this, the connotation. It's got the connotation of a metamorphosis by spending time in God's word. And you know the example I'm going to use for metamorphosis. The butterfly. What is it? I've been always been confused about this. Is it the chrysalis or is it the cocoon? I think the cocoon is the moth. Yeah, man, if I only would have learned that in eighth grade science, I would have gotten an A. Don't go on. Anyway, the whole thing is, is with this, this whole chrysalis, it starts out as a worm, ends up to be this beautiful butterfly. This is what God is doing every day. We think of this sometimes in the way of like, oh man, it's, it's taking some time. Look, I want us to celebrate the wins that God is doing in us every day because every day we're supposed to be growing in Christ according to the word of God. And if that is happening, then there's some kind of transformation that is continually going on that is saying you are consecrating yourself to God and there is radical change that's happening. The world may not see it automatically. Your church friends may not see it automatically, but it is happening. You are growing. And so celebrate the wins that God is giving you. Look, I understand about self-deprecation and hatred of sin. I understand that. And we need to be <clears throat> so sorry about our sin. But at the same time, relish in the mercies and the victories of God. Yeah, honestly. His mercies are new every morning. So here's some homework. To get on the, the track of healthy prayer and fasting, let's just take this week. Okay, I, I don't want you to check out right now. I do want you to listen. Take this week. And this whole word, consecration, I want you to think of it like this. Let's start practicing giving ourselves to God and surrendering. What is that thing that God is going to eventually clean up in your heart? And you proclaim to him, I'm yours, 100%. He knows that you're going to sin, but he is a good God and he is a forgiving God. And he's going to use that in your life to help you to grow from that. <coughs> and we're going to move on together as a church family in the right direction. And we're going to encourage each other. Part of this consecration is encouraging one another to move on to good works. So I want you to take these next three weeks, but specifically this week, and really think about this word consecration and ask God, what are the things in my life that I can really consecrate to him? That's for the Christian. For those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, here's what I would say. Fall on the mercies of God and ask him to save you. You heard the gospel earlier. Fall on his mercy. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, for anybody that doesn't know you, have them call out to you, cry out to you today and repent from their sin. And, and Father, help us as Christians to be consecrated to you. In the name of Jesus.